just like we have biblical revelation, what God has done through all the Old Testament, New Testament, we have God initiating all of that, how to contact him, how to call on him, how to worship him. So in all real rituals, they're inspired by the other side. Uh, there is no ritual that just a human came up with. It's inspired by the spirits to give designation, to give the, it's like giving a phone number. This is how you call us. This circle, this this language, these symbols, this sigil. Um, this is what you do to summon us. And if you do what we do and we give you the the the, the keys or the, the phone number to our side, if you do everything correct, and if you do everything right, we'll show up. Uh, so it begins with them. There's no ritual in any book that I've ever seen or read that wasn't inspired from the other side first. They are giving their contact number. And when that occurs and somebody gets that and they begin to do that, obviously. Even a Ouija board is a spirit-given way of contact, a doorway. Uh, biblical Greek, it's a topos, a, a doorway that gives a legal right they will come through. They want that door. The most powerful ancient rituals have been passed down and immaculately kept by the heads of secret orders from the ancient world. It is by these rituals that the gods of old are summoned and cross over, empowering their henchmen to carry out their plans on the world's playing field. The high level Freemasons in particular have been involved in some of the most maniacal religious rites gripping the very core of Washington, D.C. as they conjure the spirit of the final age. The House of the Temple, also known as the Herodome in Washington, D.C., is the Holy of Holies of the Masonic craft and is also considered somewhat of a Masonic Mecca to the Scottish Rite Masons around the world. At the Herodome across town when they are conducting the raising of Osiris ceremony, in the middle of that chapel room is an altar, and on that altar are all of the holy books of the great religions of the world. But above that is a binding utility. It's one of the most famous in all of antiquity. It's called the Magic Square of Apollo, or it's called the Magic 666 Square, uh, because the panels in the stylized sunlight above the uh, altar are they exactly the same, the same layout as a magic square. So it's a stylized magic 666 square. In antiquity that was used to raise the spirit of Apollo from the underworld, which is central, of course, to the magic based on the great obelisk behind me, the dome behind me, and the Freemasonic and Rosicrucian ideas of the return of Apollo Osiris at the end of time to lead the new world order. Now to effectualize that, at the Herodome, they conduct a raising of Osiris ceremony where the Bibles and the other books are bound beneath the magic 666 square. This square was famous in antiquity because when adding the numbers in any direct line, horizontally, vertically, the numbers always equaled 111. But when you added all of the numbers that are in the magic 666 square, they equaled 666. So interestingly, when the Freemasons built this giant obelisk to George Washington, they maintained those influential numbers in that the obelisk is 666 inches long along each of the lines at the base, but it is 555 feet high. And if you think of that as a, as a magic square, the number 111 remains and extends down beneath the surface of the earth to reach the totality of the number 666. So all of the numbers important to a magic Apollinian square used for raising the spirit of Apollo are incorporated into the design of the Washington Monument. Now what most Americans also don't know is right over here beneath the ground is a miniature obelisk made to look just like this one, except it's only 12 feet tall, 12 being the number of the perfect government that will be incorporated when the Novus Ordo Seclorum prophecy comes to its fruition and the man of sin becomes Apollo in flesh. One of the reoccurring elements of occult rituals, both ancient and modern, is numerology. The basic principles hold that numbers have a great deal of magical and spiritual magnitude. 
Some numbers are more potent and carry more power than others, and strategic combinations of certain numbers can render specific magical effects. Additionally, numbers also tie into planetary significance within rituals. In the magical Hebrew Kabbalah, each planet is associated with a number, intelligence, or spirit. The intelligence of the sun is Nakel, which equals 111, while the spirit of the sun is Soroth and equals 666. It makes sense, therefore, that Freemasons built the Washington Monument obelisk to form a magic square at its base, the exact values of the binding square of the sun god Apollo Osiris installed in the ceiling above where the Osiris ceremony is conducted in the house of the temple. 111 is also the number of the Trinity, both dark and light. Now, when you compare the raising ceremony that's held at the Herodome beneath a magic 666 square to the uh, Washington obelisk, there's some interesting facts. Um, in fact, the same Bible that Dan Brown called the lost symbol is a Bible that was placed in a magic binding square inside the testes of the Washington Obelisk of Osiris, the Washington Monument, the purpose of which is to restrain the Bible's influence, just as it is in the Herodome, while allowing the seed of Osiris to materialize. In order for the powerful deceivers to bring about their demonic will through magic, they attempt to attack their eternal enemy, the God of the Bible. Not only are these men seeking to raise the spirit of Osiris, and bring about the kingdom of the Antichrist, but they feel the need to bind the power of the living God in order to level the playing field of the last days. But unfortunately for them, there is no binding the word of God or even remotely constraining the power of the Most High. This is a great example of them trying to manifest their will into reality via ancient magic rituals of numerology. One 20th century specimen who enacted similar rituals dedicating his every breath to magic and numerology is none other than Aleister Crowley. Aleister Crowley is a Luciferian Moses, if you will, with the law of the darkest ancient magic and a proven occult track record of success. Aleister Crowley's magic and influence has been seen distinctly throughout secret societies and in the lives of celebrities, politicians, and presidents, as well as spawning various cultural movements. His themes and writings have been vastly present in popular music, television shows, and films. It's Crowley, obviously, in his adamant rejection of Christ. It reminds me a little bit of, like Judas, you know, if your heart is walled up against God and walled against, you, you become very open for the other side, because that's what the other side's all about. Uh, opposition, you know, the Satan, or the fallen cherub is in opposition to God. So when there's a heart that's bent that way, and that heart is angry and, and so forth, you already got doors being opened. And then when they pursue, demonic presence, dark side presence will only guide people to pursue darker measures so that broader doors can be opened. They do love to possess people, but maybe more than that, they like to use people. 1 Timothy 4, 1, where people become vessels, conduits, and the entities then can, the demons then can use them to write those doctrines of demons. Then that influence, look at, look at Crowley's writings. His writings influence far more millions than when he was alive. So he has charged writings, um, rituals in those writings, the Amalantra working and the crossing over of the entity LAM, LAM. Um, this is huge. We're talking about major rituals uh, and it couldn't have been done without blood. Even his own son died in one of those rituals. They're predatory, they're observers, they're watching, they're looking, and they're always gonna come masqueraded. They're, they have the power, the, the biblical Greek word is meta schizmazotai. It is it's that verse we read where Satan's able to masquerade as an angel of light. We read the verse quick, but it's real. They have the power, the supra human power, to alter their presentation without changing their nature. And it's all done and designed for the sake of deception. So in his case, this high level entity, you know, engages him. And that's part of the initiation for him from their side initiating him. Of course, he's acquiring presence, power, gaining 
what he would consider as knowledge from that side. And of course, then he's inspired to write. And from there, he pursued deeper and darker. Sex rituals and sex magic was big on the agenda, as is all the darkest of stuff. And then human and blood sacrifice is involved in it also. Now, some say in the Amalantra working, when the lamb came through, this entity that looks like a big head with two big eyes, it obviously looks like the greys that eventually came out, you know, later on in the, in the 40s uh, here in the United States, where that presence began to come out and be shown, step back from that. And the Amalantra working, the people that were at the ritual acknowledge that they know they could feel and even see something come through the porthole that Crowley in the ritual was creating. They were, they were doing a ritual that opened a doorway, but it was so big that they could see and then feel this entity come through. Uh, they always present, whether in ufology, rituals, spirit guides, ascended masters, great, great white brotherhood, that side's always morphing their presentation so that it's acceptable, excitable to the individuals. No different than Genesis 3. When the fallen cherub came there, he was like the shining one. He not only amazed with what he was speaking, but his presence would have been something to amaze Eve. Both Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard were disciples of Aliaster Crowley, and they practiced his teaching called Telema as a philosophy that is defined by the maxim, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. It comes from Crowley's Book of the Law, which can be connected to the spirit cooking ceremonies of the Podesta brothers and Abramovic uh, from the WikiLeaks scandal. Uh, but these are entities that are channeled by an incorporeal demon intelligence named Awas. Uh, Telema is a narcissistic ideology that undergirds several esoteric magic societies like the AA and the Ordo Templo uh, Orientis that fundamentally oppose God's moral law. So Satan targets sexuality because procreation is the human capability that comes closest to the divine. And as a result, it's not surprising that sexual perversion and sex magic are essential components of occult rituals. Jack Parsons, L. Ron Hubbard's Babylon working entailed all sorts of aberrant sexual activity. Now, in Delemic literature, Babylon has three conceptual aspects. Number one is the gateway to the city of the pyramids. Number two is the scarlet woman. And number three, the great mother. Uh, she serves as a portal for sorcerers. Well, Babylon working, it was a conjuring of what they thought was called the whore of Babylon, referred to in Revelation. So they thought the entity was real. Jack Parsons, rocket scientist, performed more than once the Babylon working, which was to bring a demonic high level power presence into the actual sexual act so that the spirit could be then placed inside the physical side. And at the moment of conception, their view was that that, that spiritual presence would augment. So the moment of conception, there's like a s explosion, all of a sudden the human spirit is there and that's when life begins. Well, they want to inject that presence conjure that presence. The goal was to bring about a hybrid being. The idea of conjuring the whore of Babylon in this ritual was quite fitting to have taken place in America. The occult world has long desired to revive the spirit of Babylon. The resurrection of the ancient one world system once failed, but esoterically believed to prevail at the end of this age. These occult prophecies built the framework and ideals for America to become the world's superpower and philosophic empire. The very land foreseen is the final Babylon, and revered as such, not only in the world of mysticism, but also prophetically laid out in the Bible. So on the very land of the revived Babylon, they performed the Babylon working ritual, and the conjuring began. The Babylon working sex magic rituals that was carried out by L. Ron Hubbard and Jack Parsons, the founder of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, happened through the mid 40s into 1946 and the whole purpose of it was to give birth to a magical being a moon child described in crowley's works and so they used the powerful energy of ninth degree sex magic rites that were intended to open a doorway 
through which the goddess Babylon herself, the archetype divine feminine, might be born, might come into the earth, might appear in human form. Now, Jack Parsons believed that he and L. Ron Hubbard actually accomplished this task of bringing the whore of Babylon into materialization through a series of rituals that culminated in 1946. Jack Parsons' own biography actually preserves a celebratory statement uh, in which he says that she was embodied in the womb of a female child. And in a fragment from his writings, Parson, who says he's exhausted, but also exultant, he declares the work a success and believed that Babylon, in the manner of a dark, immaculate conception, was due to be born to a woman somewhere on earth within nine months time. He actually wrote, Babylon is incarnate upon the earth today, awaiting the proper hour for her manifestation. Now, if one could believe these writings, you would expect that a female child was to be born around 1947. And indeed, such an influential feminist was delivered that year, who could offer the most promise for identifying the fruit of Parsons' infamous ritual. And that would be none other than Hillary Rodham Clinton. Intriguingly, um, Parsons later referred again to the Babylon Scarlet Woman, and this time by a particular name in his Book of the Antichrist. On October 31, 1948, a full 69 years ago, when the female child would have been around one year of age, Parsons wrote that the spirit of Babylon came to him, but this time identifying itself as Hilarion, who, he said, would grow on to become an international public figure dedicating to bringing the work of the Antichrist to fruition. Why is that important? Because the etymology of Hilarion is the arcane Hillary. Now, you have to ask yourself how many internationally influential feminists were born in 1947 who are named Hillary and that have the potential to become the leader or vice president or influence the election of the president of the United States, the most powerful nation on earth that was dedicated from its inception to the enthronement of Osiris Apollo, who the Bible itself recognizes as Antichrist and also ask how possible it would be that an entity calling itself Hillary made clear to Jack Parsons 69 years ago that it was dedicated to helping the rise of the man of sin. According to Bill Clinton in a number of books, Hillary Clinton uh, has been involved with uh, Wicca, uh, gone to so-called Wicca meetings or quote churches in Los Angeles. And she would decorate the White House Christmas tree according to uh, Gary Aldridge with occultic like figurines. Um, that's rather bizarre, I would think. She was involved in communicating with the dead, much like Eleanor Roosevelt did. All these questions came to my mind recently when reading the WikiLeaks email revelations and remembering how Hillary had hinted that alien disclosure would come if she was elected president and how the people around her, Abramovic, the Podestas, others close to Hillary, affiliates of hers, were manifest believers in the same UFOs and what they call contiguous aliens, the same that Parsons and Hubbard sought through the Church of Scientology and so on that's actually based on an alien called Xenu, as well as being practitioners of the same Crowley occultism that Parsons and Hubbard were devotees of. When you consider all this, it, it seems to be immediately um, beyond the probability of coincidence um, that in the days leading up to the last presidential election, these modern Telemus actually believed that Hillary is or that she could be the incarnation of the archetype divine feminine, the whore of Babylon, the Hilarion that is set to take the throne of the most powerful nation on earth to assist the Antichrist in his bid to rule the entire world.